What's up, nerds? Welcome back. I am Nate in the Wild. And I am Simon Eisenbach. And Simon and I have been hard at work on a new video series called Higher Ground. It is about all the independently owned ski resorts here in Utah, where we are both based. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, it's this really in-depth ski project. So we are skiing, we're carrying all of this gear on our backs. We figured it'd be kind of fun to talk about what's in our bags on a day-to-day -day production where we're literally skiing with everything you see here. Uh, that is true. And it's we really wanted to take advantage of the technology available to tell the story of all these small resorts that are just as much fun to ski as the big name resorts that everyone knows. Yeah, and this is uh, different than what I usually do. I'm not doing the light and fast wilderness kind of things. You can see we got an FX6, we got a big gimbal, we have a drone. We got a lot of stuff here to talk about and I All think it's going to be cool, so let's get into it. Now, the gear in our bags is what we use to capture our shots in the field, but all good projects need that little extra bit of pizzazz, whether that's motion graphics, animation, or just some fancy editing. Whenever I need that little something extra to take my video to the next level, I head to Motion Array. Motion Array is an online marketplace with an incredible amount of assets, from video templates, stock footage, sound effects, and graphic illustrations that all seamlessly integrate with Adobe Premiere, After Effects, Premiere Rush, DaVinci Resolve, and Final Cut Pro. Motion Array has an incredible amount of variety to perfectly fit the theme of any project you're working on, and it's entirely membership-based, meaning you pay once a month or once a year, and boom, you get everything on the site, unlimited, with license to use it wherever and whenever you want, with no additional fees. Motion Array is by far the fastest way to take your project from good to great with over 10,000 assets that download in a second. Or you can move even faster with extensions and plugins that integrate directly into Premiere, After Effects, and Photoshop, allowing you to access the assets instantaneously and to keep your workflow flowing. And Speaking of workflow, there's also a built-in collaboration platform called Review that allows clients to give you time-stamped comments on your videos to streamline the feedback and editing process and get your project approved and published faster than ever. And the best part of all is that it's absolutely 100% free to try out. Click the link in the description below to get started today. So Higher Ground does have a photo component. It's not purely video. And so for that, there's really no camera that I love more, obviously, than the Sony A1. And I have found the A1 with the 24 to 70 can do 90% of what I want while skiing, especially because we're trying to show off the ski resorts themselves. We're not trying to shoot uh, you know, a close-up of a skier like you'd see on the cover of a magazine. We're showing off the geographic location. And so I want kind of an environmental shot. 24 to 70 is perfect. Um, for those times when I do want to get a little closer or I just want telephoto compression, makes the mountains in the background look bigger behind the skier, the 70-200 f2.8 G Master Mark II is literally one of my favorite lenses I've ever used. It's super lightweight. I did a full review on this if you want to learn more about it, but uh, these two are in my backpack all day and it's the perfect combination. I don't find myself needing anything more than that. Video is kind of complicated with skiing because it happens so fast. Good skiers are going 30, 40, 50 miles per hour. So you find yourself skiing down 100 yards, posting up, they come skiing by and you have one second of footage and you repeat over and over. We found ourselves filming for three hours and getting five minutes of good shots, which is a tough way to make a film. So we've kind of diversified a little bit by having multiple cameras going at all times. The easiest way to do that is to integrate some GoPros into your workflow. Uh, these can be used as first person mounted on a helmet. We also have, you know, the selfie stick or a clamp that mounts onto a ski pole. But one of my personal favorite ways to do it is this little clamp thing here. You can mount the GoPro directly on it and get some really unique angles. I've put it on the tips of skis. I've put it on chair lifts for time lapses as they go around. It's really versatile tool. GoPros nowadays just take such beautiful footage. I really don't think they should be overlooked as a filmmaking tool. Beyond the GoPro, when you're t getting footage in the mountains, there's nothing better than having eyes in the sky. And that is where the DJI Mavic 3 comes in handy. Uh, this thing's actually brand new to me. This is the first project I've used it on. I upgraded from the Mavic 2 and I'm very impressed by it. Uh, way longer flight time, way better image quality. You guys are pretty familiar with the Mavic at this point. I don't think I really need to give you a sales pitch. It's the perfect drone. It folds up. It's professional quality imagery. And then I just kind of keep it in this little neoprene sleeve because 
All of the carrying cases for that are big and bulky and I am already carrying so much stuff. I gotta keep it light and fast. So uh, just a little neoprene case to keep the Mavic safe in my backpack. So for motion shots like the Mavic, but tighter on the skier, of course the gimbal is going to be the way to go. Uh, it's one of my favorite shots in ski filmmaking is like a great follow cam or a leading cam from a full frame camera on a gimbal. It smooths out all the bumps and gives you that beautiful cinematic motion while still allowing you to use a full size professional camera. This is the DJI RS2. Uh, it is a beautiful gimbal for this. It holds the A7S3 perfectly. Uh, that's what I have on here is the Sony A7S3 with the 16 to 35 millimeter G Master. You can see on the back I have the Atomos Shinobi, which is just a little bit of a brighter monitor. Uh, the white snow plus sunlight is very tough to see this tiny back screen on the Sony, so this is extremely helpful. And then of course we have the Polar Pro 6 to 9 stop variable ND on the front for trying to keep that 180 degree shutter angle. The most challenging part of this project was figuring out how to do the audio. Um, you know, there's times when I will be sitting with the athlete on a chairlift talking and we want to get the audio of our conversation, but Simon is on a chairlift 200, 400 feet in front of us. We didn't trust a standard transmitting, receiving lavalier microphone because there's all sorts of issues with signal interference. Maybe it just cuts out with that sort of a distance. Seemed a little bit risky. And so the solution that we settled on is this really innovative little piece of equipment called the Tentacle Sync Track E. It's actually what I'm talking into right now. You can see the lavalier mic is clipped right here, but it's just this tiny little body pack. It weighs almost nothing. I get about 12 to 14 hours of battery out of this internal uh, SD card. It functions as an SD card reader, so I can just plug this directly into my computer. But this just records internally, 32-bit float audio. It doesn't have to transmit anything. The coolest part of it, in my opinion, is that all I have to do is sync it at the beginning of the day. So on top of the camera over here, I have this tiny little time code jammer. You can see it's about the same size, a little bit smaller. Also weighs nothing, also amazing battery life. This uh, time, this is called the Tentacle Ink. <laughs> this is called the Tentacle Sync E, and it's a time code jammer. And what that means is that it generates a time code extraordinarily accurate. And I have one on both cameras. So Simon will have one on his FX6. I have one on the A7S III. It plugs into the audio jack and it generates this time code. And at the beginning of the day, I will synchronize both time code jammers and both lavalier recorders. And then they will stay synchronized ad infinitum until I turn them off, basically. Uh, and what it does is it jams that time code in through the audio port so that every single clip you shoot is perfectly synchronized with the audio recorded by the lavalier pack. And then all you have to do is you go into the Tentacle uh, proprietary software, it comes with a free license when you buy one, and it just spits out a perfect timeline for you with all of your audio and video clips perfectly in chronological order, flawlessly synchronized down to individual frames, and it can spit out a file that works for Final Cut Pro, Premiere Pro, or DaVinci Resolve. It honestly couldn't be easier. It is seamless, and the audio quality is second to none. Uh, of course, we're going pretty fast, so on top of this lavalier mic, I'm using a very impressive little windscreen kind of a tiny dead cat from a company called Bubble Bee Industries. This is the wind bubble. Love these. Uh, I've used these all over the world and they are second to none. Now, one other thing that we really wanted was to get room noise or just, you know, ambient audio. Like I love the sound of chairlifts kind of clanking around or the, the beep of a uh, a lifty beeping a ticket, you know, and so we didn't want to just rely on a tiny lavalier mic to capture that audio. We wanted to make sure we could actually get the ambient sound. And so up here I have the Deity D4 Mini. And the coolest thing about this is that it has an out that goes into the audio port of the A7S III, but it also has an in and it splits the audio signal. So I have the time code jammed signal going in and then this outputs two audio signals. So the left channel will be the time code signal and the right channel is ambient sound from the shotgun mic and it's the perfect solution. So we're able to actually get three professional quality audio channels on a single camera. We've got two lavalier mics and the shotgun mic from a single camera. It's uh, unbelievable to me because that would be so difficult to do with transmitters and receivers. 
Uh, it's the perfect solution in my opinion. I've been super happy with it. So that's about it for uh, what we have here. I guess what I would call the B cams, you know, the Mavic, the GoPro, the gimbal. Uh, I'm gonna kick it over to Simon to talk about the FX6 on the A cam. All right, here we are with the FX6, my workhorse camera. Uh, I spent five years with the Sony FS5 and jumped up to this because it is such a improvement over the previous generation's camera. It really took advantage of technological advancements. Uh, why are we using this? Because it is small and compact, but also an extremely powerful camera, which is great for us on the side of the hill because it's less weight we're hauling around, but also still getting a lot of really great shots. One of the really cool things about this camera is I'm able to record uh, 4K 120, 2K 240, and so we're able to get some really nice luscious slow motion footage of people skiing and having a blast out on the mountain. One of the most amazing things about this camera is that we have the built-in variable ND filter. The variable ND allows me to be able to quickly adjust depending on whether we're shooting in shade or sun, and it allows me to be able to really capture what's going on in frame without focusing on things that are technical and distracting and take time. On top of that, this camera also has an auto variable ND. So if we are in a weird spot where it's like shade, sun, shade, sun, and I'm trying to capture mate or other talent coming down the hill, I can just turn that on and focus on framing them. So I'm not having to worry about, am I getting the shot? I know I'm getting the shot. The shot's there, I can focus on making sure that they look their best in frame. That is one of the key things that has been great about this camera. On top of that, we have the multi-channel hot shoe, which I'm able to use the Sony ECM B1M microphone, which allows me to get that better quality ambient audio when we're getting on the lift, when we're at the base facilities, able to get that like nice laughter quality so we have that extra little bit of zhuzh, you could call it, for audio. And then the last thing that's been really great internally for this camera is we actually have the ability to plug the time code in and automatically just jam in the time code. So that way this syncs up really easily uh, with the rest of our cameras and audio recorders. Now, to make this even easier for me to use on the hill, we have added the Atomo Shinobi, similar to what we have on the gimbal, uh, on top because the viewfinder is great and the touch screen of, this, of the viewfinder is great but it's just not bright enough and it's hard to see in uh, direct sunlight. So this is great because it is a five inch monitor. It is still small enough that it's not in the way and it's not big and bulky, but it is giving me a way better ability to see what's going on in frame while we are out on the hill. Now, most of my filming is with the Sony 100 to 400. It's the most versatile option of lenses for what we're trying to do, at least for video, because we are really trying to get in and get some details while they're skiing, and we're trying to keep cameras out of harm's way as much as we can. Also, because it is such a wide range, uh, we don't have to change lenses as often, which is something that I really try to avoid doing when we are out on the slopes, because lens changes allows opportunity for moisture to get into your cameras, which can be the death of a camera. Now, there are times when I have to go away from that, which is where the Sony 24 to 105 comes in play. This is my favorite lens that is in Sony's lineup. I will grab this over any other lens, anytime, always. The built-in steady shot or like optical stabilization allows you to really get similar results to what the uh, 24 to 72 8 gives you, uh, but also it actually has a pretty good little like macro ability. So while it's not a true macro lens, you are able to get in tight and get some great details with this lens. And also just having a little bit more range is clutch. Now that's what I'm carrying. Now how the heck am I carrying this and getting it all around the mountain? I'm on that. We've got the Shimoda Action X70. This bag is a behemoth. I swear by it for this type of situation. Not only can I actually put the FX6 with the 100 to 400 inside, I am able to actually rig it on the front with a custom setup that I have that uses the pink design anchor system and some custom things that I have developed. Mwahaha. And I have also figured out a way that I can actually literally strap the whole camera to my side so that it's not bouncing around if I am carrying it on my front. Um, 
Sometimes when we're doing short jumps between locations, it makes more sense just to carry it on my front and ski slowly versus taking the whole camera, putting it in my bag and so on and so forth. It just gives us a little more efficiency so we're able to get more done in a single day. Now, all that's well and good, but obviously this is not something I'm gonna use handheld at 400. And that's where the Manfrotto 535 tripod comes in. This is a beefy set of sticks that allows me to be able to make quick adjustments on the side of the hill. Because we're mostly on groomers, I'm able to use the rubber feet without having much of an issue. I haven't really wanted any wider feet for the most part. There's been a couple times, but nothing crazy. And I've actually found myself using this as a ski pole for most of the day. And using a heli strap just comes in handy because I'm able to more easily ski with it. Um, and it's just one less thing that we have to fumble around with before we make a location move on the hill. Uh, just keeps us faster and a fit more efficient and lets us get more done during the day. Uh, and that's kind of the name of the game is like how much quality imagery can we capture in a day while also being safe and getting the uh, best result. I hope you guys learned a lot from this video. If you have any questions about any of the equipment you see, leave a comment down below. And if you wanna learn more about the bigger cinema cameras, go over to my YouTube channel, Simon Eisenbach Productions. And yeah, Higher Ground will be going live on the Journal of Lost Times YouTube. I'll put a link in the description below to both Simon and the Journal of Lost Times so you can check those out if you'd like. Uh, in the meantime, thank you so much for tuning in. It was lovely to see you as always, and we'll see you next time.